Looks like Josie has connected with the audio. How are you, Josie? I am well. I'm just going to stay off a camera right now because I am actually starving and I need to get some food in me. Uh huh. I, I know that. It's been a feeling. busy day. And I'm not, I can't really retain information, <laughs> but I'm hungry. So <laughs> I gotta eat. Well, go ahead, my dear. Hey, Nicole. Got Lee Phyllis. How you doing, Nicole? Delighted you could join us. Yeah, I saw your invite. I didn't have a conflict, so I figured I'd sit in. I appreciate the invitation. Great. You've been a hearty soul to uh, facilitate the uh, the raise group there. <laughs> Listen, I wish more people would speak up. It's always one person speaking up, and then nobody else says anything. So it looks like there's dissension when there really isn't. Yeah, it's unfortunate because I think we've lost a few people from that group because it's, you know, it's not just what happens at the group. It's the deluge of email threads that you get afterward. Nicole, could you put your, this is Eleanor. Um, could hi, you, Eleanor. Hi. Uh, could you put your um, email and phone number in the chat and I can put it up? on the uh, attendance. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All righty. Well, we're 6.03. I guess we'd better get going. And um, might as well go around. I don't know that there's anybody who doesn't know everyone, but uh, my name's John Boutte. I chair the Southwest Common Council, sit on uh, Phyllis's 19th Ward Schools Committee, and attend the um, Rochester Coalition for Public Education group. So I, and I also try to have a life besides all that. <laughs> Eleanor, you want to introduce yourself? My name is Eleanor. I'm with uh, Youth Build, um, and I'm also on the Rochester Rotary, and uh, I scribed for this meeting. Nicole? Hello, I'm Nicole Haynes, city resident, parent of students in the Rochester City School District, actually a senior now. I have two graduates and a senior. Uh, so soon, I'll be done. One more marking period. <laughs> okay. um, I am also a facilitator for the Rock the Future Alliance High School Graduation Outcomes Team. I'm a facilitator for the Rochester City School District Race Equity Advocacy Leadership Team. And one more facilitation is the Raise Education community advancing recommendations team. So nice to be here amongst other, you know, hard workers on issues in education. Very good, thank you. Phyllis, you wanna introduce yourself? I might unmute myself of the airplane going by. Uh, Phyllis Moss, I am the chair of the schools committee and um, mother of two boys in the district. One in ninth grade, one in sixth grade, and that's about it. I live in the 19th Ward near the airport. Great, thank you. Lee? I'm Lee Loomis. I lead a tutoring team uh, for the Rochester Engineering Society at Dr. Walter Cooper Academy, number 10 school. Very good, and Josie. 
Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Josie McClary. I am the president of the 19th Ward Association, and Nicole and I know each other very well. Good, good. To good. See you. Yeah, good to see you. Okay. Um, quick update on school news. Um, I hear that three of the leaders of school unions got together along with the uh, the superintendent and have made some agreements for things that need to be done for safety in the schools. Anybody got any more news than that? I've just been catching headlines, but sounds like at least they're talking to each other these days. Yeah, and I think, you know, a, a lot of it is more around safety around the schools yes. than in the schools. <clears throat> Um, because of all the car theft and all the uh, incidents that have been happening with property theft. So um, there seems to be a wonderful collaboration happening with the Rochester Police Department. Yeah. Well, that's a, a step forward. Hopefully uh, we don't get too many officers back in the schools because they had a long fight to get them out of the schools in the first place. But, okay, um, anything else that uh, anybody's caught that um, we should mention? Uh, new issues in the schools? or? Can I ask a question about that, John? Mm -hmm. My thing is always, who is it that's doing the theft and all that around the school? I mean, are, is anybody collecting statistics to know why is this happening? Because, you know, people make general comments like, well, you know, it's because of the pandemic and everybody was shut down. But, you know, are these kids that were in the criminal justice system? Are they kids that can't read? Are they kids, in, you know, from foster care? Is anybody collecting any of that data so we know why this is happening? So we can, like, deal with the problem, target the, the issue instead of guessing what the problem is? I haven't uh, seen anything that identified that. Did you have you run into any of that, Nicole? In the, uh, in the no. When we had an opportunity to hear from the police department, um, one of the things that they stated was the TikTok videos. The mm -hmm. uptick in car thefts is because someone is teaching young people how to do it easily. And then challenging them to do it on TikTok. And so that has led to a rash of Kia thefts, lots of them happening from out of school parking lots. And so, you know, the internet can be used for good or evil. And in this case, it's being used to challenge youth to do something that turns out to be relatively easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I work at a Christian school, and um, last year we had some boys that um, threw wads of toilet paper up against the wall or something like that, and we found out that that was a TikTok video. Um, so some of our kids watch TikTok too, but they're not stealing cars, <laughs> you know. And um, so, you know, again, my question is, why are who are the kids that are doing this? Um, and is anybody collecting data on these kids? Are they are they high school dropouts? Are they you know ju I don't want to call them that? Are they kids that were in the juvenile um, justice system that were released? You know who are they? Because otherwise we're just shooting in the dark. Because all kids are watching TikTok, but all kids are not stealing cars. Yeah. I haven't seen any breakdown of what they're backgrounds are other than they you know a lot of them may not be attending school right now I don't know if that's because they had dropped out and then got into trouble or are finding that it's just too tempting to go out and do these things question on the local busing update and this is something that we probably haven't discussed in the Rays group too much, but um, 
it's something that I think is important. We've been, we started in 2012 fighting for getting School 16 renovated and reopened and that happened and same thing with School 10 which they were tr planning on sending over to School 1 uh, to Building 1 which is in a zone where there are no kids and they'd be taking that out of a, a, an area in the 19th Ward that had quite a few kids so we got that renovated and reopened but the thing we've been trying to do as much as possible is encourage local participation in the in the schools probably well if you've followed any of the uh, efforts that Ralph Spezio has done in the school system. He was one of our uh, guides as we were fighting for trying to keep the schools open and try to get them to be more effective when they reopen in their renovated buildings. We wanted to try to have them be real community schools we were thrilled to see the uh, the state re put an option that uh, most of the schools in receivership uh, jumped on, which was to become community schools, because that's what we really wanted to see happen. Ralph Spezio had done that over at School 17 in the 90s, had really gotten that school to be very, uh, uh, to encompass a very local neighborhood community. He had stopped the busing to that school back when the principal could do that. So he interacted with the, the parents in that neighborhood and really, from what we've heard, you know, um, had the school be very effective. He brought... <clears throat> Uh, services to the school. Uh, he had a, a health center there and a dental center and um, it worked very well and then it worked so well that he discovered that some of the kids were suffering from lead <coughs> poisoning and went off and fought that battle at the county level and retired from school 17 and and the school just went off a cliff whoever took it over uh, wasn't all that interested in community involvement so anyways we we've been trying to make our schools very um, have a lot of local students so that parents can participate in the school a lot of parents don't have um, transportation to drive across town to go to meet with their kids teacher or for plays and various activities so for that we've been pushing for getting local busing uh, for several uh, years now in fact since we we probably the first year we were fighting for this, it became obvious that the mile and a half busing requirement for reimbursement by the, the state was really destroying the neighborhood schools because parents really feel safer if they can put their child on a bus. A lot of them depend on put them on a bus and then rush off to work. So it's very tempting to find a school that's a mile and a half away in some cases it's very legitimate maybe grandma lives next to the school and that's a good thing for the kids to go to after school but on the whole you know we've been looking at it as a problem and uh, pushing for local busing we've got bills in both the uh, and in that email that I sent out, there's uh, Assembly Bill uh, 1276 and Senate Bill 4414, which are the two bills that 
we hope will get passed, but they're still sitting in committee, and I don't know what the problem is. I, you know, whenever I've talked to um, uh, Jeremy Cooney or any of the local Senate and Assembly folks, they, they're all in favor of it, but something is keeping it stuck, so I would recommend that people let parents know, let teachers know, and encourage people to visit those sites. Those are hot links to the uh, Senate and Assembly bills, and you can ask to be kept abreast of how things are going, support the bill, and uh, if you get a chance to talk to any of our local representatives pushing them to get those bills approved would be something that I think would be very useful for us. I mean, when we had some of our interim superintendents over the last 10 years, uh, some of them were very active at supporting this. We've had parents and myself, I've gone to Albany at least once to uh, push for getting this passed and uh, it keeps failing. So anyways, the, these bills are for one half mile or <clears throat> longer bus rides that would be uh, re reimbursed and that would do a great job at reducing um, the long distance that kids are being um, bust to get to school. So I think that would be positive for the schools, you know, whether it, having half the kids in the school be from the neighborhood means you got half the parents in the, for those kids who are within walking distance of uh, the school and can be involved to try to bring up the school performance. Um, when, whenever we talk with principals and school representatives, the community uh, engagement coordinators, uh, they all agree that, gee, getting parent involvement is a good thing, but then we can't get anybody to pass this, which is seems pretty obvious. Um, does anybody have a, any other views they'd like to express on this issue? No? Okay. You know, John, I was just thinking, and I'm sure it's probably articulated in the language, but not but, and um, the safety concern is one positive impact, mm. but the positive impact on attendance positive impact on academic mm. achievement, the positive impact on social emotional growth. Um, I haven't read the bill in detail. I was just perusing it. Thank you for the link. But it seems like it definitely highlights the need because of safety, but there are so many other things that it would positively impact. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's, um, you know, it has a lot of positives. In Rochester in particular, uh, because in 2002, they had, they did the uh, um, the what, what was it called again? And the they basically the, the school board uh, passed the uh, rules that parents can ask to have their child attend whichever schools, and it was aimed at preventing parents from feeling like, gee, that I'm being forced to put my kids in this neighborhood school, which is terrible. I could send them to that school over there, which is better. So they passed regulations that parents can request to have their child be bused to another school if there's room at that school. And that's when, that's also kind of corresponds to when, um, School 17 went down the tubes because they couldn't re request that it be only walking 
students coming to the school and um, so the, the combination of this uh, controlled um, uh, school choice policy and the state one and a half mile requirement for reimbursement has really been a formula for destroying neighborhood schools so hopefully we get it passed these were we have really positive you know if we look at our assembly and senate members from the general area of rochester here they're a lot more progressive than they were five years ago and um, they've all been supporting this but there are a lot of forces in the system that are fighting for privatizing schools and best way to try to privatize schools is to screw up the, the public schools and um, so I don't know who's fighting against it. Rochester has the most to gain from it because of this combination of having uh, managed school choice and uh, the one and a half mile requirement. From what I hear, Buffalo and Syracuse and is it Yonkers? Uh, the the four city of the four cities that are uh, on have been supporting this and would be bene beneficiaries from this. Rochester is the one that has the most to gain because the other ones don't have as much busing to their schools as we do. So I was thrilled when I heard there were four school four cities involved in this, but then I'm wondering. Are the other three really as positive and committed to seeing this past as as our Rochester folks are? I'm not sure. So, anyways, that that's something that you know. If you can do anything to publicize that through the Rays Group, that would be really helpful to have a lot of people looking at how destructive that is to our schools. Um, because the other thing, and one thing that I want to stress is, when you have school kids going to the local school, they make friendships. And then they go home, and they can play with those friends who live three blocks or four blocks away. And the parents get to know each other from those friendships. And you build community from having the local school be the predominant school that kids from the neighborhood go to when they're coming from all over the the city they don't have that sense of neighborhood that you know they make friends well their friends are two miles away and uh, parents don't get to know each other as much they don't look at the school there as that's where my kids went there isn't the, the same affinity to protect the school. Uh, so I think it really has been uh, a way to destroy neighborhoods in our schools to, to not have more local school involvement. Anyways, I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, Question. Yes. So suppose the legislation uh, passes and, mm -hmm. and parents don't want to send their kids to the neighborhood school. What oh, happens? Send them, uh, what we're proposing with this is not that we take any rights away from the parents because they will scream bloody murder if we do that. And rightly so. Some of them have researched things well, but you know, people don't like to lose rights. Uh, what we're just saying is, if you make it easy for a parent to choose a local school and they don't have, you know, that's half a mile away, they may choose to use that as a destination for their children versus one that's on the other side of town. 
Um, so anyways, that's, um, that's been one of the things we've been pushing for about 10 years now. Uh, avoiding standardized test mentality. That's been, um, especially in the, in the, uh, Rochester Coalition for Public Education, they have a lot of former principals, former superintendents, teachers, a lot of people involved with education, and a lot of them have, you know, been looking at how, how much the stress for, for high tests high-stakes testing has been hurting our schools and there are that first link in the uh, avoiding standardized tests mentality if you click on that it goes to um, a proposed uh, way of trying to reduce that to you know and it reviews some of the thoughts about you know kids when they they're just a baby they learn to speak a language nobody's sending them to school to do that and nobody's testing them on it but every time they they learn a new word and mom and dad are excited as heck to hear them say mama and dada and all the things that reinforce a child to learn the language and be thrilled about doing this there are a lot of things that once you, you put the child in school and they say you sit there and you listen to the teacher and you know there's a lot more restrictive approaches to teaching in many schools and anyways some of the things that uh, are referred to in in that link and also uh, Lamal Bauman's uh, More Teaching, Less Testing Act, which uh, hopefully will pass sometime soon. That's trying to push towards having more ability for teachers to use the excitement of kids learning as a way to motivate them rather than telling them that the rest of their lives will be hell if they don't pass this test and flunk out of school. So it's trying to get to a more positive way of teaching. And um, yeah, that, that would be a, a plus. The more teaching, less testing uh, article that is linked to there does a pretty good job of explaining some of the concepts involved with that. Well, the graduation measures conversation is happening at the New York state level is moving in that direction. Yes. So, you know, I just put a link in the chat for the uh, performance based learning assessment network. Uh, and it's a, it's, it takes you to NYSED um, but it's exploring the potential for New York's educational assessment strategy to be reimagined mm -hmm. in a way that purposefully fosters high quality instructional opportunities, provides authentic measures of deeper learning, and better prepares students for college and the workplace. And so you know, they're calling it the plan pilot, P-L-A-N, for, for performance-based learning and assessment networks. And so, you know, New York State is uh, exploring, moving in this direction. Um, it appears as though their, their uh, open-mindedness right now is focused on high school uh, and moving away from the regents and other standardized graduation measures to more authentic performance-based assessments. And so, you know, that's another art resource because the Board of Regents is examining that right now. Um, hasn't made any concrete decisions about it, but it certainly appears 
as though we're going in that direction. And the next step would be to get some high schools to commit to use the performance-based assessments for their graduation requirements uh, and apply to the state to do that rather than having to have their students take the regions. So um, we are making some progress at the Board of Regents and at the New York State Ed level. So hopefully that uh, momentum will continue to move forward. There was a wonderful, the webinars are really great. The last webinar was a group of high school students and maybe one or two of them have graduated, but talking about how their performance-based learning experience really helped them to, to really be prepared for real life, more so than what they um, would have experienced with just taking a, a standardized test. And so the webinars are an opportunity to kind of hear what this, what what experiences those schools, uh, such as Urban Assembly in New York City, are doing, in order to have a career in technical education focus that's more problem based, uh, and uh, even locally East, their curriculum, their assessments are performance tasks, and so just again just. You know, there there's definitely some secondary focus on that now, and hopefully uh, soon enough it'll be K twelve because it's already pre K. Pre K is very experiential and 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 uh, real world based. Pre K students have more access to career conversations than most students do, simply because of their centers and their dress up opportunities to be doctors and, and lawyers and chefs. Uh, in the pre-K uh, atmosphere, which is very experiential. We just need to continue that throughout the mm -hmm. grades. Yep, that's for sure. One of the things that's been hurting us in being able to do that is at the federal level, they're you know starting with the no child left behind um, regulations that went through during the Bush administration uh, there's been a push to make sure that there's a correlation between the tests you have and the, the, the wages that the teacher makes. Uh, they've been pushing the high stakes testing and sad to say Obama wasn't a whole lot better there. He had what is the race to the top legislation that went through and those have been pushed by, you know, the Bill Gates of this world, people who have a lot of money and influence on at the federal level and perhaps at the local level too. But um, when when we we had a meeting at the coalition with, I think it was with Bronson, and um, they brought up the fact that. There's a big push from the federal government and the monies that they control that go, go to the schools to uh, keep pushing for high stakes testing. So um, Lam Lamal Bauman has, you know, he's a congress, he's in Washington, congressman in Washington, he's been pushing for the More Teaching Less Testing Act, and um, hopefully they can change the attitude that the federal government is taking towards the states, because that's been hurting us locally here. I don't know how and we got some of the same feedback from our local rep, um, what's his name, um, um, Morelli? Anyways, he, he mentioned that, you know, you, you talk to the other congressmen in Washington and a lot of them are pushing more for the high testing approach to things and uh, so hopefully things will change a bit at the federal level. Um, I'm delighted that you're here to talk about the raise recommendations in our schools, um, Nicole. <laughs> I. Um, 
I put the link to the latest uh, uh, webinar that we had a couple of days ago, whenever. And uh, but that was pretty dry, you know. I at least you guys showed up in person at the actual night of the webinar, even though there were some problems figuring out how to get multiple people showing on the screen besides just the uh, the uh, sign language interpreter. But then in what got released, it was an absolutely dry. We had the sign language interpreter and then the the PowerPoint, which left a bit to, you know, wasn't quite as excellent as I had hoped. Somebody decided not to use the original because of the, the gaffes they had with with who was on the screen, what was the reason there. Nicole? You're, you're muted. You said someone decided... Oh, well, Lord, I'm, no. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, the, the final... Because um, I was recording that... Uh, um, the pr presentation also and th <laughs> towards about halfway through they I think it might have been after you uh, made your presentation they got some of the people who were actually talking showing up on the screen which I thought was much more uh, you know, invol involved people looking at it a lot more I did ask that question and because those of us who were speaking were let in a different way and what was pinned on our screen when we were speaking was the interpreter. Uh -huh. So that the interpreter could be visible while we were talking to the people who needed the interpreter. Right. But I have seen webinars <clears throat> where the person speaking yeah. and the that's show up right. on there and so i was messaging you know behind the scenes and they couldn't seem to get that to work mm -hmm. the person who was speaking and the interpreter uh could come up on the screen i i just hope that it was clear in my presentation one that the focus areas that are currently in the report for education uh, were found by the commission itself. And so the education cart is currently putting out a survey so that we can get from those most impacted by structural institutional racism what they believe the priority should be based on the recommendations. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to be clear that the recommendation, the focus areas that showed up on the screen when I was speaking were the focus areas that were found by the commission itself. Right. And as a team, we've been saying, you know what? We can't just decide that those are the focus areas. We have to ask the people. Mm -hmm. So um, in a moment, I'll try to find the survey. The survey hasn't been approved by the team yet, but it would be nice to get people such as yourself to to go into it and see, is this something you think would be feasible? Because what the team decided is that they wanted all 25 recommendations to show up on the survey and they wanted community members to be able to rank them one to 25 based on what they as an individual felt was most important. Mm -hmm. And so in order to do that, you literally, you have to look at a recommendation, scroll across and click one number between the numbers one through 25. And you have to do that for 25 items. 
And for me, it seemed like a bit much. However, we need to test it out, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I created the way the team said they wanted it created. They wanted not to just, because the team felt, which I can understand, if we decide what the top 10 are and only give them 10, then in the other 15 might be something that people thought was important. Mm -hmm. That maybe somebody who was in the meeting that day didn't think was important. So rather than trying to make that decision for the community, the team wanted all 25 recommendations to be put in front of the community and let them decide from 1 to 25, 1 being your highest priority, how uh, the community would rank them. But what, what so, were we going to rank each one, uh, 1 to 25 or 1 to 5? So the last conversation that I was in, we wanted them sorted from 1 to 25, most important at 1, least important at 25. I know that we also had a conversation when Josh was on that each one would have a Likert scale, you know, mm -hmm. to one to five, agree or disagree. And that actually, um, I could design a survey that way as well and see which one is most user friendly. Because yeah. the point is you want people to actually do the survey. That's right. The thing that worries me about the one to 25 is you put yeah. down 16, well, did I use 16 before? Then you have to go back and look. Going through when I was testing it. So I'm going to recreate it, John, because you're right. We did have that conversation as well. And I'll have both. And then when the team meets, we our next meeting is the first Thursday in May, which is the 6th, I believe. Mm. so that we can look at the difference between the two because we need to get it out like we've been talking about it too much at yeah. this point we need to get it out to the community we'd love for each member of this team to fan it out to um you know members of of, of your networks mm -hmm. um and john i think you're right i think what's going to win the team over is to be able to say you know on a scale of one to five this is how important this one is to mm -hmm. me do that for each one mm -hmm. yeah. rather than trying to rank them one to 25 because i i was testing it out on myself and you forget it you're right yeah. did i use yeah. 18 sure. already or <clears throat> you know right so i'm going to develop a different form with that with that uh model in mind um and then when we meet we'll decide you know which one just so your team knows and i know you guys probably navigate this way as well we're trying to be as democratic as, as possible. Yeah. And, and when we're being as democratic as possible, sometimes that takes more time, but it just ensures that one person's agenda is not what drives every discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad you said that, John, because at least we'll have two examples and then we can choose from the two examples because I only sent out the one. Yeah. So I'll definitely, before uh, the end of the day tomorrow, send out a second. It definitely Example. would be helpful for me, and I'm sure everybody else. There are so many things, you know, that follow the same title that you have in some, yeah. something you sent out. It's hell finding the latest one where you give a new date for the meeting or time for the meeting. I mean, I, I've, I've probably missed some meetings because I... I looked and I looked and I finally said, the hell with it. <laughs> She'll what probably send from, me something out again. I'm sending out the calendar invite because I counted. I literally counted. And forgive me for this, guys. Between one message that I sent out and the second message, there were 19 messages in between. Yep. And that's just from people going back and forth about stuff. That's not directly related to what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm just going to send out calendar invites from now on. And this way, same way you did with this meeting, okay. right? It'll be the calendar and you won't have to search through a string of emails to find out. So I just did that for the real team meetings that are coming up. And I'll be doing that for the raise uh, team meetings that are coming up. And I already, because I have a backbone team with the Rocky Future, they do it for the high school graduation outcomes teams. Um, so 
they're a wonderful team over there with Rock the Future. So I never have to worry about any of that as facilitator. They do all the backbone stuff. So thank you for that suggestion. I definitely will do that. So in a nutshell, with the raise education recommendations, the team right now has developed one version of a survey. There's going to be another version of the survey. And I'm, I'm glad that John uh, prompted my, my memory that we did actually have another version. And when we meet next meeting, we're going to pick which one of those versions is going to be put out to the community so that we can get from the community what is their highest priority and then begin to narrow thinking, focus on that priority or those priorities so that we can see some movement um you know in the work one thing i will say though is because the recommendations were being developed from the perspective of what can the city and the county do the the suggestions are not very specific to what schools and school districts can do mm -hmm. and so that <clears throat> you put pose a challenge because when you're trying to get things done in school systems, you have to involve schools and school districts. The county and the city don't have as much leverage over the decision making because you have school boards and you have leadership, executive leadership teams, and you have building principals, and there are decision making power at all of those levels. And so we're going to have to think strategically, um, you know, about how we realize the recommendation when the city and the county don't have the last say. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, the, um, let's see what I got here. Now, the uh, African American History Act that Lamal Bauman also has introduced, that link goes, you know, covers some of the issues that should be taught in school and we need to get some of that stuff out because the Ray's recommendations was pretty dry and left people you know two hours of that you know by the time they got to your <laughs> session their eyes had glazed over I think we have to really capture some of the issues that stir people's blood and and mention some of those because um, so anyways that's I, I will say real quickly that the college board's african-american history ap course is being piloted at edison hmm. and so there is room for schools to, for example, the anti-racist curriculum project is a part of the scope and sequence in the Rochester, District, Rochester City School District for 4th, 5th, 7th, 8th, and 11th grade. And so I, I can appreciate the act, but I also know that we have some agency within school districts to begin to use the curriculum mm. that would help our children grow in terms of uh, self-identity and um, accurate historical um, telling of, of really what happened with black and brown people mm. and a variety of uh, uh, in um, people in, in the American uh, education system and in the development of America as a nation. And so, you know, even without the act, we have room to do. And so Edison has decided that they're going to pilot the African American uh, Studies AP course. Um, the social studies director has decided that he's going to put units from the anti-racist curriculum project in the scope and sequence for those uh, elementary and high school grade levels. So, you know, there is work still to be done in having it actualized in the classroom. Um, but, you know, the, those are decisions that we can make now. We don't have to wait for the, the, the bill to be passed. Even though we want it, we don't have to wait. 
I had two. Um, I had a question and a comment. Hopefully, I can remember them both. Um, I remember when the original recommendations came out that I had a difficult time seeing where the schools committee could fit in. We want to fit in, but I couldn't see where we could fit in. I think you all added some additional um, points to the education section. Am I right about that? She's muted. Muted. Um, what we noticed was when you look at the general recommendations, the overarching recommendations that are in the beginning of the report, several of them apply to the education. And so we, we made sure that when we stated what the education recommendations were, we included those instead of just using the ones that are in the education section. Because for example, the hiring of uh, significant numbers of black and brown people in not only the school system, but in the county is an education issue as well. But it's stated in the general part of the report and not in the education section. Okay. So we pulled that those recommendations as well um, so that it's not just the ones in the education section, they're also the ones in the overarching uh, recommendations. So let me point this out. It's ironic because I just got a, a text from my son's teacher. My son, I have one son at School of the Arts and one at Children's School of, the Ro of Rochester. Mm -hmm. So like, I, you know, back to John's question or, or dialogue about the one and a half mile bussing. If that became a fact, in effect, I would still not send my child to number 16 school. Because one of the reasons that I chose those schools is because even though you all have not implemented African American studies, you know, in the other schools, but at Children's School of Rochester and School of the Arts, they're already getting that. Yeah. My kids are exposed to children all over the world. I don't want my children to be narrow minded. My son at School of the Arts, one of his teachers showed um, um, Henry Gates, um, the African civilization. I haven't even watched all of those yet. Yeah. You know, so um, also you know, some of that is already being done. They're, they're not waiting for you. <laughs> that, and they shouldn't. And they shouldn't. That's that. That was part of my comment earlier. My oldest two graduated from School of the Arts. My senior is at School of the Arts. And my oldest had Stephen Cohen, who now is at Central Office. But my son says Stephen Cohen should be back in the classroom because he was such a great social studies teacher. Um, and he brought to the benefit of my now senior, a text by a gentleman by name of Foner, F-O-N-E-R. And when you read that social studies text, the story's being told the way it's supposed to be told. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, you know, Jay Piper at Children's School um, uh, of Rochester is not waiting and, and nor should any, you know, we should not wait for an act to be passed because we have the materials mm -hmm. You know, East curriculum, they have a whole course on hip hop and the hip hop culture and what that has done um, happening at East and also happening at Northeast. And so you're absolutely correct. Um, the choices we make for where our children go to school, I was very particular about my three as well. Um, and busing was not my deciding factor. No, and even though I think it's ingenious for our parents, I mean, I didn't learn that that was an issue until I started working with this committee. I would never think to bus my child to a school across town because they're on the bus and that's kind of a form of daycare because I got to be at work at seven or my mm -hmm. kid's school doesn't start until 730. That would never occur to me. I'm not that smart. <laughs> you know, I mean, that just shows a lot of ingenuity in a parent. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But I'm going to I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at the recommendations again. But I will tell you the issue that I do have, and I hope this is a part of what's um, in the recommendations, is the teachers and their lack of understanding of our kids. I just got a text because my son, my sixth grader, he is not disrespectful to teachers. Right. He's disrespectful to me, but not to teachers. And for the first time, he's in sixth grade. I got a call about him being disrespectful to his teacher. And his frustration is 
with the school environment, you know, the stuff that's going on, the teachers that they, he said one of his teachers called all the boys in the class stupid, you know, uh -huh. he got in, in trouble for walking by a chair and touching it, you know, and nobody was sitting in it and, you know, being called the N word and the B word and all that. And after a while, that negative environment affects our kids. And yes. I think some of it comes from the teachers. I think their biases and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I think it weighs on our kids. Yes. One of the things that Dr. Candace Lucas is being uh, very clear about is if if there is another group working on something, then rather than the race uh, cart working on it too, join them in their efforts, right? So the, the Rochester City School District Racial Equity Advocacy Leadership Team, which is the real team, they have an equity action plan that speaks specifically to professional learning for all staff that interact with our scholars. And so one of the things we've been able to do through that team is we've gone out and done some anti-racist education sessions in the schools and we've done them for teachers in um, at central office during the summer. We develop a mod we developed the module, the first module on creating a common language around race and racism in the American education school system. And so we've started that process. In addition to that, uh, I didn't tell you guys that another part of my identity is that I'm the executive director for equity in the Rochester City School District. And so we offer professional learning around the culturally responsive sustaining education framework, around everyday anti-racism, which is a text that I've been giving uh, to all of our staff um, around Zaretta Hammond's culturally responsive teaching in the brain, around Golden Muhammad's cultivating genius. Um, these are all texts that are being um, uh, digested, for lack of a better word. What school could be, um, Lord, I'm blanking on the author's uh, name, but the title of the book is What Schools Could Be, and Franklin is digesting that along with a book called uh, School Talk, you know, how we talk to and about students in schools by Mika Pollack. And so there are some efforts happening within the district in terms of professional learning. And there are also some efforts being pushed by the Racial Equity Advocacy Leadership Team. And so the RAISE CART is supporting the real team in that since it's work that they're already doing rather than creating you know, a, an additional arm that's working on that professional learning. But you're correct, you know, bias and implicit bias and anti-racist uh, ideology, we have to help with mindsets around that. Because even the term disrespect is value-laden, right? It's culture-based. What you consider disrespectful in one culture might not be disrespectful in another culture. And so when you, even when we use that word, we're trying to be more specific about, well, what have you developed norms with the scholars in those classrooms that you all have agreed to abide by in this community? Rather than just saying, well, that was disrespectful. Well, no, I'm exasperated and I'm expressing how I'm feeling. That's not necessarily disrespectful. If the environment is so uh, uh, distracting that I'm exasperated as a student. Um, so you, you, you're absolutely right. The RAISE team doesn't have professional learning as a recommendation, but the real team does, and we're supporting those efforts. Well, I have to jump off, but I want to say this before I go. Um, I usually, I've been trying not to complain this, this um, school year but I'm usually the parent that's emailing the, the principal. Um, I don't know why, I don't know how teachers are can come in from another district and decide what professional development that they're gonna take. If you're gonna work in an urban district, then you need to, there's certain um, professional development uh, classes that you should be required to take. And even as an African-American, there are things that I've learned that I didn't know and understand in the last 20 years working in, in human services and whatnot. So I don't know how that happens. Um, well, that definitely, 
um, I would encourage you to also, as you email the principal, also email our uh, chief of human capital, um, Dr. Miller. He's been an, an excellent partner with the racial equity advocacy leadership team. And that is one of the things we've been talking with him about, mandatory professional learning. Um, and how do we ensure um, that those who are new hires to the district are getting that implicit bias conversation, the culturally responsive practice conversation. And so he's thinking strategically about ways, for example, new hires, it's not a big segment, but from 1045 to 12, the last Friday of every month, new hires have uh, a segment on the culturally responsive sustaining education framework uh, out of the New York State Education Department. But we definitely need to do more and the Racial Equity Advocacy Leadership Team, the real team, has been sitting down with the Chief of Human Resources to find out what do we need to do? Do we need to write it into the offer letter? Um, the superintendent just got additional superintendent's conference days for next year. So could we use one of those days to make sure everybody gets at least a foundation? And so we are having that conversation. And I think that the more people that let him know that this is something that you're interested in as well um, is helpful. And we have to do a better job of letting parents know that we're advocating for this so that they can become a part of our advocacy group. That's something that we haven't done a great job of. We need to do better. And it doesn't have to be something that's offensive. If you want to be the best professional that you can be, I mean, all of that training for me, and I worked at BOCES for eight years, all of that has made me a better professional. Why would you right. want to be better at your job? Right. I don't get it. Right. And quality, high quality professional learning around culturally responsive practices is not going to be offensive. It's going to be uncomfortable at times. But if you've read Glenn Singleton's Courageous Conversations About Race, we know that that's one of the tenets of courageous conversations. You're going to experience some discomfort, but lean into it for the sake of the learning. But the goal is not to be offensive because making people feel bad doesn't help them do good. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. I got to jump off. I'm late. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you for joining here. us. Josie, do you have anything to add to the conversation? You've been awfully quiet there. And I'll have to go too, John. I apologize. Okay. I put in the chat. There's Joe at seven thirty. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> nothing to add. Nothing to add. Just good conversation. Um. Definitely. Um. There's some a lot of areas that we need to really definitely um strengthen and 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 definitely because you know I love number school number sixteen is my heart so definitely getting the attendance and getting those reading scores up is very important for mm -hmm. me as well. Um, but, you know, I know the education race um, part team and the, and the education part is in good hands with Nicole. So um, if she can make the, make anything happen, she'll definitely make sure that the, the kids, you know, education is okay. sound. And so um, thank yeah. you for joining us tonight, Nicole. Yeah, it would be good also if we can get teachers out into the neighborhood a bit, you know, and I know mm -hmm. we're, we're going to be doing that with Square Fair and the 19th Ward, but really trying to get neighborhood members to invite the teachers to walk down the street to a restaurant for lunch. So, so there just are so, so many so, who are deadly afraid of stepping off the school ground. Yeah. You also have your pre-service institutions like St. John Fisher University that is doing that more with their student teachers so that as they become teachers, they don't have those fears. Yeah. And so they're being very uh, intentional about having their students do asset mapping of the neighborhoods that they're um, doing their student teaching in so that they can understand that these neighborhoods are not much different. Uh, from their own neighborhoods, they have high quality, loving people who care about their families and who are doing their best. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to tag team on that, and then I have to go too. So, um, I did survey number 16 school just to see how we can engage the teachers with the parents. 
and then the teachers and the parents with the community because a lot of times we do have some students in number 16 school that don't live in this community but i think because their child does go to number 16 school they need to know the community in which they, mm -hmm. their kids go to school and so i did survey um the school with that i did get some responses back from parents none from teachers but i'll keep trying and then um and i also um know that St. John Fisher, I did interview with them as the president of the 19th Ward, and they asked, how can they be helpful? And Nicole, I said that same exact thing. Come out to our community, come walk with us, come break bread with us, come and learn what we do and how we are. So you can see for yourself that we are in a loving community, just like any loving community in Pittsburgh, Penfield, Brighton, wherever else. Yeah. We have that here. So I am working on that. It's just not confirmed, which is why I haven't brought it to the group yet. So I I had to um, ask, you know, forgive me, but I got to jump off. So thank sure. you. God okay. bless everyone well, and have a good night. Delighted to have you with us. And Nicole also, it's been a pleasure. And I hope you can join us more often. Now, next month, I may be traveling because of some surgery my wife needs to have. We thought it was going to be this weekend but then they postponed it so i'm juggling several balls here um, no problem john as long as you inform me if i don't have a conflict uh, i'll be there okay thank great. you so much thank you yes good night take, take care, care. Yes. have a good, good night. night mary coffee Ooh. you always come at the last minute i know john i'm all over the place you know that. <laughs> how are you Good, good. We're uh, just wrapping up here, but I'll try to... Uh... All right. I have a down. It's from 7 to 8. You have a what? My email. My email said 7 to 8. Hmm. I don't think... Well, no, that's not what... I'll send it to you. Okay. I thought it was strange. <clears throat> yeah. Uh... <coughs> I don't know. I, sh I should have. I don't know. It's April 26, 6 p.m. is the email I sent out. Yeah, it's always that. All right, I'll show you. Yeah, I got two emails. Yeah, I sent one out through Google, and then I sent one out through regular mail because you never quite uh, know who doesn't maybe, get what. Um, maybe I read it wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, it wasn't until Monday that I found out we weren't going down to Houston for the surgery this weekend. So uh, I got a late That's start a at this one. Yeah. <laughs> That's a trip. Okay. You, you well, do know, John, mm -hmm. um, Don Bartello and the group are also working to meet with the governor. Oh, um, good. And to, uh, will, it, will it take place? Who knows? But we can keep going to do something about our schools. Okay. It, the well, state is very much responsible here. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the last email I sent out uh, at 6-something this morning, um, after pulling in an all-nighter as I often do, uh, that's got a lot of links in it that you may want to look at. Um, yes, yes. And uh, it covers a lot of the things that we're we're fighting for. And um, I will go into that. And yeah, I will make but, sure I, I I edit and post this uh, the video I'm recording for this meeting here, so that. And you are the pioneer here. You are the man that has set forth for years to improve and and god bless you well thank you and hopefully we will all see each other again next month but i depends on when we're going to be traveling so take care everybody okay hope everybody right, had John. a good time didn't he so good luck. take care eleanor you knew have a new haircut uh, it's just shorter and usually oh, I'm cute. wearing that. Yeah, Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Natural curls you got, girl. Yeah, yeah I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 
Well, Make thank you, plans. everybody. I'm sorry. Okay. John, I'll send you what I have, and I probably okay, very good. Messed it up. I'm so sorry. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.